you know, hello, my name is Sarah Guff, and I will be moderating this webinar today. And we have a lot of ground to cover, so I will just start um, the presentation and then pass it over to the many colleagues and students who have joined us to talk about virtual exchange today. So let me share again. So welcome to this event. Um, so the focus of today's event is going to be on learning outcomes and students' experiences. Um, this is one of three events, and the previous one focused more on institutional outcomes, whereas today we really want to focus on what um, students and their teachers experience when doing virtual exchange. So the event is organized by uh, the European Project Evolve, uh, evidence validated online learning through virtual exchange, um, the Erasmus Plus virtual exchange pilot project, and the EU funded project NICE network for intercultural competence to facilitate entrepreneurship. So, um, we have quite a full schedule um, today, um, but we're going to hear from lots of really interesting people, so that's good. Um, so we're going to hear um, from Francesca Helm and some of her students about the Erasmus Plus Virtual Exchange Project, then the impact of student learning on student learning in the Evolve Project, um, educator and student experiences in Reading the City Project, um, and then some student work and student experiences in the NICE Project. Um, and we will leave time at the end for questions uh, and answers with the audience and the panelists. Um, so, uh, as you can see, this is a webinar and therefore you will be able to see the panelists, uh, but we will not be able to see you or hear you. So how can you get involved? Um, well, please use the chat uh, tool at the bottom of your screen, both to uh, interact with one another and maybe exchange some ideas during the various presentations. Um, the chat tool is solely there for you participants to be able to interact with one another. Um, then you will also see at the bottom of your screen a question and answer, a Q&A um, button, and that is where you can pose questions. Um, I would actually like to ask people, if possible, to maybe write down your questions on a piece of paper as we go through the different presentations. And then when we reach the end of the various presentations, um, then to post your questions at that time when I ask you to. And we would also encourage you to um, comment and discuss things on Twitter. And these are the hashtags that you can use. Hashtag virtual exchange and or hashtag VE next steps. So I'm going to pass it over to my colleague Francesca Helm and her students. And they're going to talk to you about the Erasmus Plus virtual exchange project. Francesca. Hello, hello, good morning everybody, and it's very nice to be here with um, Shadi and Dileta, if you want to make yourselves visible. Um, next slide. Oh, but you... I just wanted them to be vis visible for a minute so we see the people. Okay, next. So I'm going to be talking about the Erasmus Plus virtual exchange, which many of you are familiar with. And I have been working on the research of this with Bart van der Belden. Um, next, Sarah. Um, for, for those of you who don't know about it, it, it was a pilot project, three year pilot project funded by the European Commission and implemented through a contract um, from 2018 to 2020. The target area was youth in Europe and southern Mediterranean countries, and the aims were to engage young people in meaningful intercultural experiences online as part of their formal and or non-formal education. And both Dileta and Shadi, who have invited to talk, have experiences both in the formal and non-formal sector. Next. Um, this is the, the, the hub where the Erasmus Virtual Exchange is um, promoted by the Commission. And I'm going to focus on the research question, so I won't describe the various activities, just that there are several models of virtual exchange. There was the virtual exchange, the, the teacher to teacher virtual exchange, and also um, large group facilitator led virtual exchange. 
Um, but the research questions regarded all, all of the activities. So did Erasmus virtual exchange have an impact on participants' perceived effectiveness in intercultural communication, self-esteem, and curiosity? Um, did it have an impact on participants' effect towards other groups? And so here, the, the two groups, I suppose, were, were Southern Mediterranean and European participants. How did participants evaluate their experience? Did they feel they improved their competences related to employability? Um, can Eve promote citizenship and the common values of freedom, tolerance, and non-discrimination through the building of positive relations and enhancing intercultural understanding? What challenges did participants, facilitators, and coordinators, coordinators face in this project, and what improvements could be made? So every year we were asking these questions and improving. And what are the strengths and weaknesses of the different models of virtual exchange being piloted? Um, the research methods we used pre and post exchange surveys. Um, amongst these tools, there was the feelings thermometer, which asks participants to review, um, to report how they feel about people from different ethnicities or different religious backgrounds. We also did interviews and focus groups with uh, hundreds of student participants and also some educators, youth workers, and um, policymakers. Um, in 2019, last year, we had 2,130 post-exchange surveys completed, and we did interviews and focus groups with 89 participants, facilitators, and coordinators. And the previous year, we also did 100 interviews. And these are results from the first two years. This is the number of participants engaged. So we had 18,678. The target for the three years is 25,000, and we are nearly there already. Um, I won't report all of the numbers, but you can see them here on this slide. Next, Sarah. And again, these are just some numbers on the in, in impact that the satisfaction was high amongst the young people who participated and also the facilitation trainees. Um, this is how they reported on the competences developed. And on the right, you can see that the pre-post measures, so for self-esteem, curiosity, cross-cultural communication, and, and the strength of relationships. You can see the strongest um, growth, the difference was on cross-cultural communication before and after. These are the measures across all the four different models of virtual exchange that we were looking at. Um, but you can read more about this in the impact report. So I, w I won't um, bother you with the details. The, the Commission has finally published the 2019 impact report, and here we go into detail about the different models of, of virtual exchange. So now I would like to pass on to Dileta and Shadi, both of whom uh, took part as students in the virtual exchange activities. Um, Dileta, would you like to say a few words about your experience? Hi everyone, I'm Diletta from Italy and I want to give my experience uh, as an Erasmus Plus uh, uh, virtual exchange uh, ambassador and also student. Uh, so I attended the program uh, for 10 weeks during my university semester as an alternative of my English, English course. And it was a great experience because uh, I uh, attended the course Cultural Encounters uh, Perspective on Populism and it was focused on uh, some uh, video lectures, some uh, dialogue, uh, some um, exercises, video from experts, uh, and um, also um, discussions uh, uh, with people from uh, Europe, but also with the uh, south of the Mediterranean, so the Middle East um, people. And it was uh, um, a great opportunity for me to share my ideas, uh, to learn more uh, about some topics uh, that are connected with my course uh, of study. So I'm studying political science, international relations and human rights. And during these uh, 10 weeks, uh, we focus on uh, this topic. So we um, attended uh, videos about migration, uh, about uh, open identities, globalization. So all the themes uh, um, that citizenship, uh, national authoritarianism, so all um, the um, 
all the uh, things that you can uh, you can see nowadays and are really really important for your studies but also for uh, for your identity for for yourself so it was um, a great chance for me because uh, it was um, the first time that i had this course online i had uh, some experiences abroad uh, um, two study trips uh, one in uh, in America and one in Malta and also some youth exchanges uh, around Europe but they were uh, physical so it was really different from uh, my online course uh, because um, it's, a, it's a new chance to, uh, to stay in front of a, a computer for some hours and speak with people that uh, maybe you, you can uh, start a relationship, start uh, um, start to see to see them uh, for maybe two hours a week and create a group like a class a classroom and uh, it's really strange because at first firstly you can uh, you th you think that it's impossible to create a relationship with people that, that live uh, far away from you miles of uh, kilometers from you but uh, at the same time you learn uh, to to share your ideas your opinions uh, and to learn from them and to discover also uh, more about yourself because uh, you learn not from uh, from the courses uh, because of in the professional way i mean you you learn not about some topics uh, only from some topics uh, uh, that uh, that are really famous nowadays, but you learn also from the other people' experiences, and uh, I I've now also I'm still in contact with people, for example, from uh, from Syria, from uh, from Egypt. So there are people that um, we I hope we will see in the future, but they are uh, really far away from me. But we we can create a relationship in just ten. 10 weeks so it's really it's really strange but it's really challenging also so i think um, this uh, this type of uh, non formal learning this type of uh, experiences online these courses uh, are really really important for pe from people from from youth for the youth because they they give a chance also to um, to, to learn from uh, from uh, from for your studies uh, and for your future careers and also because nowadays job interviews are uh, always uh, online so if you start uh, from the beginning to learn to speak in front of a computer to speak with other people in english to learn to to develop your competencies uh, in languages uh, and um, to to learn from other cultures, traditions, to learn in team. So um, I think uh, you, you can improve yeah. all the things and also from <laughs> yourself. <laughs> no, you're wonderful. So she's been talking about the, the Thank you. similar experience to, to Shadi has had. Just it's to difficult to, to, um, to try to speak to the other and to to focus on all the things that you can learn in just one uh, one course. We can see your enthusiasm though. So you you delayed that and also Charlie took part in exchanges where they were um, met for two weeks with the support of facilitators. So they had these dialogue sessions. Um, Thank you. Every week. So now Shadi, would you like to say to us? Sure. Um, it's really a big pleasure first to be here um, and. Uh, one of the best things that has happened to me in my uh, journey of two years now in, uh, in the Mediterranean between Italy, France and Tunisia was meeting uh, Professor Helm very, very randomly in a conference um, at the university uh, where I attended in, in Venice, Kaposkari University. And uh, it just was the start of so many beautiful things for me. So a little bit about me, I'm 26 years old and I'm an Iranian citizen living and studying currently right now in Italy. But um, I was studying inter-Mediterranean migration and mediation. So when I saw this project coming up, my, my mind was just like, okay, this is something that will be very relevant to the work that you're going to do um, now or potentially in the future. And, um, and I took the opportunity to attend several um, programs with the, the Erasmus Plus virtual exchange platform. So um, one of them was Countering Hate Speech. Uh, that was in uh, late 2018. And the next one was uh, Youth Peace Building course, which I personally was really, really pushing for to make it happen because I have a background in peace building. 
and about three or four uh, years of experience. So the highlights of attending these uh, dialogues or these courses for me was that um, I was at a very strategic position. So I was, if potentially we could group Iran into a big stereotypical category of uh, Mediterranean or Southern Mediterranean countries, I was from one of those countries. I had lived in Tunisia for a period of time for my exchange. So I knew well the culture I was studying, the history, political development, economic and uh, social phenomena in those countries. But at the same time, I was based in Europe. So whenever I attended a dialogue, I found it very nice that there is the space created for people to come together. And as we were going more um, forward with the programs, because I attended one in 2018 and one um, in 2020, so I could see the evolution as well. I could see that there are actually more international students in Europe who are taking these, um, these courses and they're attending these dialogues. And I thought that it's really beautiful because for me, I was not taking it as a credit or um, as a way to, uh, to you know, support my studies. I was taking it genuinely because I was curious and I really love a virtual exchange. And I could see that more international students are attending and this is really diversifying the, the audience in the room. So we do virtual exchange for a number of things. We do it to have cultural dialogues. We do it to understand what dialogue means. And people who might out of that room not be able to see eye to eye and not have a facilitator to smoothen the exchange and to just go to one another with a lot of presuppositions, with a lot of um, guards up, then would suddenly become gentle, open-minded, able to, to have a fruitful dialogue. And I think the role of the facilitator is really important and I'll come to that later. So I could see that people like me who were international students and already were in Italy, so we were not just an image at the other end of the screen, we could testify to everything that we are experiencing and, uh, and, and our daily lives and how it feels to be in the space that's in between these two countries because you're not fully European, but you're also no longer um, in, in your home country. So I thought that that's really a beautiful part that, that gives you a very strategic overall, um, let's say dominance or knowledge and information. But at the same time, it's really a great uh, opportunity to become a facilitator because the virtual exchange um, gives you an option to attend the, the facilitation training. So I already did the first one and then I also have to um, start the advanced one one of these weeks. So that is really useful because it gives you a sort of skill that later on in your life, wherever you work, having the ability to be a neutral and multipartial facilitator can help you get better jobs, can help you work in a smoother environment, even if you're not, you know, pitching, climbing that uh, corporate ladder or professional, um, uh, let's say, course of your, uh, your daily life. So the, the role of the facilitator was something that I had not fallen across in the academic, in the formal um, environment. And I was really glad that this is being introduced to more universities and more schools and young people are motivated to take um, the facilitation training, not just NGO people, not just um, people who are involved in non-formal education, but basically young people who just take this course to learn what it means like to be a facilitator. And these were some of the highlights that I really enjoyed and I appreciated uh, about this course. Of course, I think that it's great that it also op had the option of offering trainings to youth workers, to motivated young people, to NGOs, um, to universities. So that's a side, um, side point, a side bonus. Uh, and I don't think this opportunity comes really easy to be trained for free and offer the platform to, to tailor your course. All you need is determination, a plan, and uh, the will to take over. But feel free to ask me any other questions that you might have about my experience, the courses I've done. And I'm really a big fan and a big advocate of this program, even though it works a little bit on limiting mobility for people, because now you have virtual exchange, so you're learning about other people's cultures. But at the same time, it's also good to make people come on the same page and try to, um, to advocate for removing the mobility barriers and more in-person intercultural exchange. Thank you, Shadi. Thank you, Diletta. So I know we, we're out of time now, but there will be questions. Time to answer questions at the end if you do have time to stay with us. So now I pass the floor to Miriam and we'll disappear. Okay. Let's, on, let's move on swiftly to the Evolve project. Um, and we are starting with my colleague Elke Nissen from the University of Grenoble, who will talk about insights from the research we carried out in the context of Evolve. Elke was and is 
the leader of the research team. Over to you, Elke. Thank you very much, Miriam. So hello, everybody. The research outcomes I will be presenting in this virtual event stem from the Evolve project, as Miriam just said, and are based on the work of 15 colleagues from seven institutions who are conducting this research together. The Evolve project aims at mainstreaming virtual exchange in higher education, and this is to be achieved through research, training and dissemination. One of the major focuses of the EVOLVE project is to confirm the positive impact of virtual exchange on student learning through a large scale study looking at different VEs within different contexts, but also the impact of the practice of VE on in service teachers' competence development, which was, to our knowledge, not previously evidenced by research. Next, please. The 16 VEs analyzed in our project are all class-to-class -class exchanges with two or three different partners. Our results are globally positive and show that VE can be a powerful means for competence development at a student's as well as at an in-service teacher's level. They are based on a mixed method approach to the analysis of quantitative and qualitative data from 248 students and 53 teachers at higher educational level. These data stem from a second and major round of research we conducted after a first pilot round uh, with a lower number of participants that had aimed at testing and then adjusting our research protocols. Next, please. Our study looked primarily at students' development of four types of competences, intercultural communica communicative competence, ICC, disciplinary skills, critical digital literacy and language skills. And here I will briefly summarize the main results. Um, the analysis of ICC is based on the Council of Europe's model of competences for democratic culture. In line with former research, it evidences that ICC enhancement is not an automatic process within VE and is subject to certain conditions, such as well-functioning group work and others that I will indicate later. The Wolf research results show increased confidence and ability to communicate and collaborate online with people from different cultures, increased ability in adapting to other people's social and cultural behavior and in managing conflict in international online contexts, increased knowledge on the partner's culture and greater understanding that one's own beliefs, worldviews and practices influence the way one communicates. But nevertheless, there's also a danger of overgeneralization and minimization of difference. Regarding disciplinary skills, our study provides evidence that in the student's eyes, VE allows to gain significant increase in the knowledge and skills targeted by the course it is integrated in. The main represented discipline in our sample was future te teacher education and the study confirmed that VE contributes to developing related knowledge and competences, but more notably and across all the represented disciplines, our analyses show that VE is a valuable means for developing students' transversal skills, such as collaborative teamworking skills, greater adaptability, organizational skills, and communicative competence in general or in an L2. Moreover, our study evidenced in an increase not only of general digital competences, but also more specifically of critical digital literacy. Significant enhancement could be observed for a great majority of self-perceived competences and knowledge. These include use and appropriate choice of text, audio and video communication tools with regard to the communicative purpose and context, and awareness of the respective impact of these tools on interaction, on the perception of others and potential bias. In the area of language skills, most of the analyzed aspects are based on the common European framework of reference for languages. Our study confirms on a large scale many findings of former studies on language development through VE. The comparison of students' self-declared competence before and after their VE experience shows significant improvement <coughs> sorry, regarding a number of aspects, which include communication ability, 
confidence through the opportunity of language practice with peers that helps to overcome the fear of using the L2, of course, if the language of the VE is an L2. Vocabulary range, interaction, propositional precision and thematic development, spoken fluency. On the basis of the analysis of qualitative data, other improvements could be stated, such as adapting, what means that students formulate things using words known by the VE partners. Again, these outcomes are subject to several conditions, including a sufficiently challenging language level within the VE. Next, please. Our analysis show that VE is a pedagogical practice that is generally highly appreciated by students. Nevertheless, general VE appreciation as well as learning outcomes depend on several factors. On this slide, you can see 10 major factors we found in our study. Students' overall VE appreciation was, was found to influence their readiness to engage with VE group partners. In an online learning setting such as VE, entirely based on socio-constructivist principles, that is to say, where learning, set, uh, where learning outcomes are set to be achieved through learning from one another and through collective knowledge and competence development, student engagement and well-functioning group interaction and collaboration are, in turn, the basis for a successful VE experience and for learning. The main factors for VE appreciation and learning outcomes we found are Students' perception of the VE as a valuable means for learning, especially for learning outcomes he or she considers useful for the future, such as collaborative skills, L2 skills, teaching skills for pre-service teachers. Clear, clear, clear VE and task design and instruction and good VE organization. The topics and task types used. An adequate time frame for task completion a necessary balance between task orientation and informal interaction with peers. The development of interpersonal relationships between, between VE partners <clears throat> so that others are considered as people who matter, as Belts puts it. Own and partners participation and engagement. Adequate teacher support. The purposeful integration of VE within the course. And last but not least, appropriate and well-functioning communication tools. It was found that the integration of video conferencing sessions appear to be crucial to relationship building, to capturing the partner's communicative intentions with the help of audiovisual clues, and to allowing for more fluid communication. But the combination of video conferencing and text-based communication tools appeared as being ideal. Next, please. On the teacher's side, several aspects contribute to their competence refinement and development on the basis of a learning by doing process. With regard to this, in-service teachers value not only this of new experience, but also the continuously renewed learning experience VE represents and the inspiration, collaboration and support from their international partner teachers. It is not astonishing that we found that putting into place and carrying out VE leads to increased knowledge and competence <clears throat> specifically related to VE, such as VE design skills. But moreover, um, our analyses show that teachers also refine or develop the general pedagogical competences such as task design and constructive alignment and a greater awareness of the need for scaffolding. These okay, extend just to let you know you have a minute and a half. Yeah, that's great. Thank okay. you. Um, these extend and enhance their teaching repertoire, which then also feeds into their practices and others than the VE-related courses. In the same vein, our study brings to light many different facets of student-centeredness, all nurtured by the teacher's VE practice. Some of the teachers who indicate they had already very student-centered practices before consider VE as an additional pedagogical tool for putting into place student-centeredness. Related personal competences were also refined, for instance, digital competences, ICC and transversal skills such as cooperation skills and critical thinking. 
Next, please. So this is my last slide. <laughs> to sum up, our research confirms on a large scale results from numerous case studies, but also from other studies such as the Elf Evaluate uh, project report and the EVE project report and hence fulfills its aim as a tool for provi providing evidence on the potential value of VE to stakeholders. It furthermore allowed for additional findings regarding student learning as well as regarding in-service university teachers' competence refinement and development. And on this slide, you can see the URL where you, you can find very soon the two project reports I summarized here. Thank you very much for your attention and I will hand back to Miriam. Okay, thanks so much, Elke. Now we have Marlin Kleeman, Kasia Radke and Cecilia Magadan at Tridem from universities in Sweden, Poland and Argentina. Their partnership arose out of the training Evolve offered to educators, the collaboratory, as we called it. And they're here to talk about their VE project and some of their students are here to talk about their main takeaways from their virtual exchange experiences. Over to you. And I think Cecilia will start. Is that correct? Well, I will start. Uh, you will start, Marlin. Take it away. Well, wait, it, it would Thank be nice if, if everybody speaking in this session, in this part, just turned their video on. There we go. Okay. So, okay. Fantastic. Okay. Great. I'll now share the screen. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Again, so, Marlin. Yeah. Yes. Um, this is a map showing our institutions. We had a three way collaboration together between Sweden, Argentina, and Poland. Uh, we can go immediately to the next slide. Thank you. And I also would like to say thank you for inviting us to speak here today. We're, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I will try to speak very fast because um, time is short. So, well, first of all, I'd like to point out that our virtual exchange was actually interrupted by the outbreak of the pandemic during spring semester. Uh, as a consequence, we had a topic shift from reading the city to a much broader global dialogue anchored in the ongoing uh, spread of COVID-19. In this talk, we will share some of our experiences as educators and as uh, virtual exchange uh, practitioners. We also will hear from two of our students. We're, ha we're very happy that they're joining us today. Uh, first, some very brief background about our project. So next slide, please. The project started in March uh, this year and we had a preparation week at each home institution, followed by six weeks of online intercultural exchange. And then finally a concluding follow-up week at home. We had 67 students involved, 11 transnational teams. It was an interdisciplinary project and English functioned for us as a lingua franca. Our learning aims were focused on multimodal critical digital literacies, and intercultural communication. And of course, there are a multitude of skills and competences included in those two huge areas. Next slide, please. Just very briefly here, in the very first week of the project, there was a dramatic turn of events due to the outbreak of the pandemic. Our reading the city topic was all about physically going to town and exploring different ways in which local cities and urban cultures are interlinked with global issues. In short, we wanted to use the city as a text, a resource for learning uh, with our students. However, instead we faced a situation of national quarantine imposed on Argentina and Poland and some very different strategies unfolding at the same time in Sweden. As most of our students were suddenly restricted to their homes, it was not possible to go through with the original topic. This was a challenge. And as teachers, we had to make a very quick decision in the very first week, either postpone the project altogether until next year, or practice some flexibility together with our 67 students and just shift the focus over to current events related to COVID. We opted for the second route and a point of departure was the question you can see here at the bottom. How do consequences of COVID-19 affect your city and your life? 
Um, our 11 transnational teams approached this question in very different ways, but the unifying element was the use of virtual exchange as a tool for critical transnational dialogue about some very real world problems at the time. Now, what did we gain from carrying out this virtual exchange? Uh, I should also add that it was the very first time we worked together and uh, carried out this project. Um, we will share a few insights from our respective disciplines with you. So I hand over first to Cecilia. And we can have the next slide, please. So good morning, everyone. Well, in my few minutes, I will try to share with you some of my student voices and just five things that I learned from this virtual exchange. It was hard to choose uh, uh, only a few quotes from my student portfolios. Luckily, you will next meet Nico, and thanks Nico for waking up early because it, it's only seven here in Buenos Aires, seven, like 7.40. All of my students' stories conveyed important lessons, but here I go with just two pieces. Uh, the, wisdom, the wisdom of the first quote is probably lost in translation. It's all about being a student and a teacher in the South of South America. Here we are a school to learn that Europe is the model, not to mention Scandinavia. And then we have to be schooled again to confront that idea. So when the student says demystifying, we should read here questioning. And when the student says differences, we should read distinction or power. The wisdom of the second quote is the idea of learning by doing. The voice of this student underlines how different we are in different groups, but also how a task in a group transforms each individual, the task, the learning and the product. Now, what did I learn by doing as a teacher? I will first point out three pedagogical lessons that I got out from this VE. One time, the map shows that we do not share the same clocks, but that it's not that terrible. The perception and the values attached to time and deadlines are more important. In my teaching, time is not written into stone because I know things here change all the time. For instance, the school calendar suddenly changed a few hours before we were to start this VE. Two, we don't teach alike and we don't learn alike. This VE taught me that it was necessary to make teaching styles explicit to my teacher's partners because teaching and learning were taking place in very different settings. Flexibility is a key word in Argentina. All policies are changing daily. Then we have to learn as teachers to be flexible. But the good news is that this flexibility comes together with creativity. Often we, as students and teachers, may not have connectivity, electricity, or a quiet place to work at home, but an incredible piece of music as one that has been composed by Lionel and recorded from a cell phone in the bathroom of a small apartment is a very nice example. Three, from this VE, I also struggle between taking part or not in, the sum, in some of the drama that comes along with group work. And do not forget that Argentina is also tango. Many times my students reached me because they didn't know how to react to a certain conflict. So I felt it was key to become a cultural mediator, even a translator in the sense of culture, or simply a good listener to help them understand that we all have the right to be different. And that sometimes these differences might mean that we don't get along with others. Sorry if this is not politically correct. To conclude, I will just point out two lessons relevant to my research field in linguistics and multimodal literacy. One, following all exchanges and e-portfolios from our VE, I could confirm that we should continue questioning and reshaping the idea of teaching languages as fixed codes, like some objective and neutral data of words. But instead, we should value the creativity of languaging that occurs in communication how we all put together different multimodal resources, emojis, gestures, audios, music, memes, pictures, etc., in order to make meaning and convey our ideas. From the very beginning when planning this VE, I knew that this project was not meant for my students in Argentina to learn English, but for them to become aware as future teachers that language is about a repertoire of resources and what we can do with them. 
And one last thing, I learned that critical literacies are about scaffolding. Choosing the topic is critical, but also the topic has to be critically approached. What is the audience of my text? What genre is the best to convey my speech act? These are critical choices, but digital tools are critical as well because the materiality of an online tool conveys meaning and ideologies. Next PE, I'm sure we will a lot more time to examine and question the material and ideological side of digital tools because these tools are not transparent. In fact, if digital tools were natural, we should all be right now chatting in a beautiful beach in Brazil. So thanks, and uh, I pass on to Kasha, my teammate. Next slide, please. Yeah, I will be very brief. Um, this virtual exchange on the Polish side was integrated into, into an English course. So the language uh, was really, really important. And it turned out that the students I teach, master students of tourism, who are about to start their careers and use English to, to deal with their customers, to deal with the visitors who come to Poland, uh, and international tourists, that those students are really afraid to use the language, that they don't, do not know how to uh, talk to people from other cultures. There were huge fears at the beginning, uh, whether they would be able to understand their international partners. My students had to leave their personal, their linguistic and their cultural comfort zone. Poland is a country relatively monolithic when it comes to culture, religion, um, uh, and uh, the way of teaching. Uh, so um, I'm happy that I involved 22 students as volunteers into this project and who had the chance to develop their, the skills which will be really vital for their future careers. Uh, the students worked in teams. For them, it was also kind of a new experience. Uh, Project-based learning, uh, group learning is becoming more and more popular in Poland, but this is not a typical way of working. So my students uh, working uh, in international teams with people uh, who see basic things differently, like a task, like a, de like a deadline, uh, a way of reading a text, for them this was an unforg unforgettable very, very important uh, experience. They had the chance to, uh, to develop their initiative, personal motivation, time organization, critical thinking, innovation, problem solving. Um, they worked during the times of the pandemic. You can see in the picture the, the university campus, the faculty of Ge geography where I teach and where I work is totally deserted. But my students were not lonely during this part, th during the time of March and April 2020, because they had their international partners with whom they could discuss, negotiate, sometimes even argue um, some issues uh, about the project. But in the background, they had discussions about, uh, about the pandemic, uh, about uh, ways of coping uh, in, the, in their personal lives, but also uh, when it comes to, to the authorities, uh, legislation, um, certain rules imposed on them um, during this time. My students learned how to engage with difference, how to, uh, how to, hmm, negotiate their point of view. It wasn't always easy, it wasn't always perfectly smooth, but this, these were the learning points because they have to go to work in future business uh, enterprises, which are not one, may, uh, one man person, one, uh, an individual enterprises. Uh, they will work in international organizations, maybe in political bodies. They have to know how to talk to people uh, of varying um, opinions, varying perspectives. What was new for my students as well was uh, experiential learning. Um, we teachers were kind of supporters, guide, we, our role was that of a guide on, uh, on the side, not, not the sage on the stage. Most lectures, most, most classes in Poland are delivered from, uh, by the teacher uh, from a higher position. Here the students, in a sense, were left on their own and they had to search uh, in their teams what skills, what abilities they had. They had to build dependability, uh, trust, um, and engage personally in every detail of the project. They have to share tasks and this was new for them. They really liked it, they enjoyed it. This was something absolutely new. Uh, we engaged our students in self-reflection and this was 
I guess, uh, the most important stage of learning, the most important moment, because when we do things, sometimes we don't think much about that. And our students we, uh, collected their thoughts, their reflections in e-portfolios um, and during the group sessions and during the final week, which was devoted purely to, to reflection. Uh, that's why we know quite a lot uh, how they felt during the, during the project. You have two quotes, but they are not enough. And, uh, and the student highlights all the elements I, I mentioned. Students say, we had a chance to improve our language skills, share unique experience. We had a chance to learn to become a team, learn from each other, together do something different, unusual, create something new and make new friends. And uh, they also highlight uh, that the um, pandemic outbreak was a critical moment for all of us, for the teachers, for the students. But in many cases, it motivated them to work even harder, uh, to, do, uh, to do their best. And most groups were really proud of the final uh, project. And many mentioned that maybe not the final presentation, blog or website was, uh, was the thing they were proud of, but they were proud of the process of, uh, of communication, of collaboration. And that's why we believe this virtual exchange was so successful. Now I think it's time for Malin to present her perspective. Thank you, Tasha. Can we have the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, the students from Sweden are all training to become, become uh, English teachers. And for us, virtual exchange opens up learning by doing opportunities, as my colleagues mentioned here, uh, and to experience and explore some key issues in our discipline. And just to mention very quickly here, some questions would then be, what does global English mean in practice? How is power related to language, culture and identity? This is something that we would like to explore more in depth um, in the next project. Um, the dynamics between North-South, uh, center margin, margin, etc. How do we understand the complexity of intercultural awareness and self-reflection linked to that? And how do we organize teaching and learning to promote multiliteracies, critical reflection, and engagement with real world issues in foreign language education? Uh, it was very difficult to choose a quote. Um, this one, I think, is interesting because it shed lights on a notion that came up quite often in my class, the notion of insiders versus outsiders. And this is something that we feel is quite important for the subject of English. Uh, English as a school subject, at least in Sweden, is notoriously dominated by outsider perspectives. And this is certainly the case in our textbooks for the classroom. Um, the virtual exchange has the potential to offer a very different and powerful approach to learning in an interconnected world. Uh, and I want to stress potential because it also, of course, takes a lot of planning, effort, task design and um, institutional support as well. Uh, I'll stop there because uh, we need time to hear from our students. So next slide, please. And we have invited today Nico Fernandez from Argentina and Natalia Coma from Ukraine. So Natalia and Nico, please if you would like to share some of your experience with us here today. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. And I, it's nice to, to see again Natalie because we were in the same group. We were uh, teammates. And it's nice to, to be part of this virtual exchange once again. So I would like to, to say one thing that I learned from this experience that it's very important to me because uh, every time I, I have to, to introduce myself uh, in a different language, in, in English, in my second language, the first thing I will have said before is sorry for my English. You know, uh, I always uh, feel, felt, I used to feel afraid, ashamed of mispronouncing, of not knowing which words to use which sentences to make, how to express myself. I used to be afraid of uh, not communicating myself. So that was very difficult to me in a, 
in, in the beginning. But with the group and with the exchange of ideas, making the project with, the, with my teammates, uh, we, we said we don't have to say sorry for our way, our way to speak, you know? We don't have to feel sorry of mispronouncing because uh, the way we talk, the way we speak is part of ourselves. It's part of who we are from our country, for our, from, it's part of our experiences, our stories, our friends, our family, our houses, our, the things we do, it's ourselves. So Frederick, uh, he, he said to us, don't apologize because nobody here has English as a native language. We are all learning from this and we are trying to communicate. And that was the, the important thing from this experience. I, I think this is the, the most important thing that I learned from this exchange is to communicate, to, to take the chance to meet somebody that is far, far away from you, who speaks a different language, who has a different way of living, um, to communicate uh, without fear, to communicate it's to be in the same page, it's to understand one, one another, it's to, to get to know each other. And that's the, the most important thing because uh, we... I hate, to in I hate to interrupt students, but yes. we have one minute left. So, okay. And maybe, I, maybe people have more questions for you at the Q&A part of, okay. at the end I of will, the car. I will synthesize that the most important thing is to, to take the chance to talk, to speak. It doesn't matter if you don't have the best pronunciation because the important thing is to know each other, to experience this and to learn from each other. So if you have the chance in the future to, to communicate with somebody that you don't know that has a different language, take the risk, as we say it here in Argentina, animate, you know? uh, do it, speak, because communication uh, connects us and connecting with with other people it's a way of learning so that's the most important thing that I would like to share with you today. thank you Nico maybe Natalia if you could just keep it very brief and then hopefully we'll give you more time at the end sorry <laughs> no that's okay uh, first of all I would like to thank organizers and teachers for the opportunity uh, to take part of this project. It was a really interesting experience and I must ad admit that at the beginning uh, I was a little afraid uh, about whether my English is good enough, uh, whether I would be able to present Poland well because I'm from Ukraine and I uh, live in Poland just uh, for uh, one year. Uh, but fortunately, I was very successful with the group and the time of the project passed very fast. Um, and to my opinion, our tasks uh, helped develop very important uh, skills. For example, um, in uh, my group, we paid attention to the uh, time differences uh, between um, Argentina and Europe and always discuss important think, uh, things. Uh, at the time when everyone could join and I think it uh, um, shows tolerance and respect and teach us um, to think not only about our, ourselves but uh, about others, but about others' cultures and in my opinion such skills are very important for me as a person who will work in tourism in the future uh, because people are different and it is necessary uh, to learn uh, communication, uh, taking into account a birth and a culture of another person. And I also like that my partners ask me not only about uh, Polish, but also about Ukrainian traditions. And uh, this uh, proves that each of us um, is not only aiming to do the project well, uh, but also, uh, despite of the educational tasks, we aiming uh, to know each other better. And uh, quarantine, which is uh, enforced in Poland and Argentina, uh, was not a problem for us. Uh, students from Sweden uh, who did not quarantine in that time uh, showed understanding. And in this situation, we use our uh, digital skills 
and this project um, bring, uh, brings us closer uh, to readiness for the change and uh, objective assessment of the situation. And I think this project is very important for people like me who don't um, take part in Erasmus, but still want to uh, communicate with people from another country and uh, still want to use English. And uh, thanks to the project, I opened that Marmo is multicultural, that Buenos Aires is colorful and dynamic. And the project not only gives an opportunity to practice English, uh, but also brings us closer to knowing the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Natalia. Um, and hopefully we'll have time to hear from both of you um, later on. And I would just encourage Nicolas and Natalia to take a look at the chat because they've been saying many nice things about you. <laughs> so we can now move on to our uh, next group of presenters from uh, the NICE project. Could you turn on your video so we can see you before we go to, we've got Justine and Justine. Hi. Okay, so I'll start sharing my slides and you guys can start. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much. Um, good to see all of you. Um, so we're going to present a nice project. My name is Justine. I'm project advisor at the University of Edinburgh. And you will also hear from Jackson, who um, went through the nice project in 2019, and Marcin, who went through the nice project in 2020. Um, so next slide, please. Thank you. Um, next one. <laughs> what is the NICE project? So it was also like uh, even involve a um, an European Commission funded Key Action 203 project. Uh, if we go to the next slide. Thank you. And the goal of this um, was to build employability skills for students in eight um, different institutions. So again, using the, the, the transnational um, team approach. Um, they were supported um, through uh, seven online modules you see there. They were put into teams and all worked through a platform while each team was also asked to develop a solution to a global challenge which was um, something that they applied for uh, at the application stage. They chose which challenge they would want to work on um, and spent um, however many weeks, it's a very flexible program, going through the online modules, also meeting as a team online every week um, and developing a solution to their global challenge. Um, at the bottom, I don't, sadly, it's a little bit low on the slide, you can't see, but we had an in-person um, summer school in 2019. And because of the pandemic, we had an online virtual summer school this year in 2020. So it is designed as a blended learning project, but it also worked this year as a fully online project, a full virtual exchange project. And you can see in the box on the right, someone asked the question earlier um, in the session. Um, we also designed a pathway to, to obtain an academic credit. So students um, who were willing to, who volunteered, could undertake what we call a slick, student-led, individually created course, they had to submit reflective reports, reflect on their experience, the experience of collaboration, um, and academic staff would assess those reports. And if they were successful, um, we awarded them 10 ECTS credits, which could then, for our students, directly for, um, they could get them directly. And as you know, with exchange, um, for our partner institutions, they would um, translate that credit. So that's how we, we uh, offered the opportunity to get credit for the, the program. So next slide, please. You can see here the, the partner universities. So we had students from a range of nationalities um, studying at Amsterdam, Dublin, Lund, Padova, Salamanca, Göttingen, um, you know, in Kusa, in Yash, and Edinburgh. And because we're all mostly uh, quite multicultural countries, we had a wider range of cultures. Like the other projects, English was selected as the lingua franca. Um, so similar um, sort of interesting situations arising with native students and non-native English students in the groups um, collaborating and finding 
common ground uh, in terms of language. And you see here the global challenges that they were working on. We were very keen for students to be able to try their hand at really real life projects. That's something that they, they, uh, they said that they were interested in on the at the application stage. And those challenges are very much based on the, social, uh, on the, the sustainable development goals of the UN. Um, so we wanted the program to be academic, but also practical and real life. Our next slide, please. That is, so that was pretty much sort of an overview of the NICE project, it's quite complex, difficult to, to boil down in two minutes. Um, I've been working on the project since, since it started in 2017 and it's going to end uh, later this year. We got an extension from the Commission, otherwise we would have finished right now, actually, early September. And I was also, as well as working in, in, in developing the project, I was also a facilitator for um, the two years that the NICE program has run. So I wanted to speak a little bit about facilitators. I was very happy earlier to hear that in the EVE project, we had 99% satisfaction uh, among facilitation trainees. That's definitely been my experience as well. It's a very rewarding experience to facilitate online. Um, we found facilitators from partner institutions who nominated both academic and professional services um, staff. And they were then allocated a team and kind of um, started discussing with their students and discussing how they would arrange their sessions. Some teams had the flexibility to arrange sessions on an ad hoc basis. Um, others were very um, sort of were very uh, regular from the start. The facilitators were trained um, with a facilitation roadmap document that we wrote with a lot of information there about how to guide students towards a discussion but not be too directive. Um, we also had a meeting with all the facilitators um, before they met their students um, and where we kind of discussed managing expectations, seeking help when they need to, etc. And then when the program was running, the online program, we also had a WhatsApp group uh, for all the facilitators to be able to discuss issues as they arise um, and had several two virtual check-ins um, with all the facilitators during the program and a final debrief to make them feel really supported and be able to address issues as you might expect with online programs of perhaps student engagement, um, sometimes flagging and, and that, those kind of, of problems. So we had a very close-knit facilitator community um, throughout the project. Uh, next slide, please. Here just a few, a few um, do's and don'ts uh, for facilitators that we used to train and support them um, through the process because we had a few facilitators who had never done that before and, and there was not really a time for them to, to follow the established e-facilitation training which takes a certain period of time so we, we had to get them to hit the ground running um, with a very sort of accelerated training, um, let's say. Uh, next slide, please. And this is a reminder of what I said at the beginning. We have a complete virtual program as well as a physical mobility add-on in 2019. See some pictures here in Dublin. Um, and in 2020, because of the pandemic, a fully um, virtual program with, again, it's kind of regular, long collaboration over time towards a project at the end and then later on in the summer an intense week-long um, sort of um, learning experience as well so we still use those two formats and the next slide I think there's a bit more information on the virtual summer school from this year I'm um, not mentioning the, the physical one but this one uh, that happened this summer was organized virtually by the University of Salamanca and students participated in workshops um, which they could dip in and out depending on, on interest. Um, they also had online mentoring sessions with experienced business advisors because their, their final project needed to be a, a solution to a global challenge. Um, the teams of students pitched their solutions online as well, practicing how to, how to give an effective presentation virtually 
which is something they will need to do um, in the workplace, but perhaps haven't had a chance to practice at university. And the, the, the three top teams got to pitch again um, at another event the next day in front of, of a, a, actually a dissemination event like this one. So we gave them the opportunity to, to present their work to a much wider audience um, as well. And if anyone's interested in knowing a bit more about how that was structured and sort of the content of sessions, et cetera, feel free to, to get in touch um, with us. I'll put my email address in the, in the chat if it helps. So we're doing for time good. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. We're gonna hear from our students because I think that's, that's why we're here um, for, to hear our students' stories. Um, just before I hand, them, I hand over, um, I was also wanting to, to say that, like what Kasha was saying with the Evolve project, we found out from our feedback forms that collaboration came first every time on the list of, of what the students liked the most about the project. Um, they gained a lot of skills, they practiced a lot of, of um, activities, but collaborating with each other across borders always came top of the list um, of what was really the most interesting part of the project. So now I'm going to give up um, the mic to, let's start with Jackson, who um, went through the NICE project last year and is going to talk to us in about four minutes um, about his experience in 2019. And then he will pass on to Martin, who did the program much more recently this year um, and attended the virtual student conference as well and will also share his experience. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Jackson. Uh, I'm zooming in from Washington, D.C. this morning. Um, so nice to meet you all virtually. Um, and as Justine said, I uh, participated in the NICE program um, while studying at the University of Edinburgh. Um, and I think one important factor there was the fact that uh, I participated in the program while studying as a postgraduate student. And so I think oftentimes with these programs, you know, there is generally the focus being on undergraduate students being able to participate um, and, and taking advantage of those experiences. However, um, I think one of the really important factors for the NICE program was that it gave me the opportunity in just a one year uh, postgraduate master's program, the opportunity to uh, actually participate in an international experience. Um, and I think that was across the board, you know, um, while I went to the summer school and, and also on my team for the virtual learning environment, um, there were students that were also postgraduate students, um, even PhD students as well, which I think, you know, really, really shows the versatility of the program. Um, you know, I will definitely underscore the fact um, that was stated earlier that uh, while the focus of the program was definitely on entrepreneurship, um, I think that many of the, the trainings that were done and the sessions that we had throughout the program were largely um, focused on uh, building these international teams that we were working on and actually, you know, building those competencies of, of intercultural competence and communication, um, which I think, you know, the last six months have really shown um, are critical to build in a in a virtual atmosphere and and definitely have challenges with that um but but certainly were were really critical skills that were gained um through the program um i'll be really brief just to leave time for questions but um we'll just say that another important aspect of the the project development side of the nice program was that we were continually emphasized to make our our final uh pitches and our final projects um, actionable, which I think was really important because we were, you know, tasked with addressing these these really large sustainable development goals that are really international challenges. However, um, I think that the program really emphasized for students the the opportunity to think of these challenges in a way that students could actually go out and implement themselves. Um, so instead of reaching for these massive, you know, uh, international collaborations and, and those types of projects, um, they were actually actionable items that we pitched in the end. Um, so I think that really brought it back to the student in terms of what they could do um, and what they could ultimately, you know, act upon after the program was over. Thanks, Jackson. Thanks a lot. Um, Martin, do you want to share your experience too? Yeah, sure. So I hope that uh, we can't hear you very well. I think your microphone. Can you 
Should you try without the headphones, perhaps? Uh, no. ah, now we can hear you. Okay, that's great. So, Go ahead. Zooming from Edinburgh, but I'm originally from Krakow, Poland. Uh, here in Edinburgh, I'm studying uh, in my second year biochemistry, and last semester I had the opportunity to take part in the NICE project. Um, together with uh, four other students studying at different universities and coming from different uh, countries, uh, I had the opportunity to talk on the uh, solution to the chosen global challenge so and also learn a little bit more about intercultural communication and entrepreneurship in a specially designed uh, course uh, online course and what I really like about NICE is that we were provided with an access to, to a platform that facilitated uh, the learning uh, experience but also our cooperation throughout the project and also uh, another thing that I really liked was that it wasn't a passive learning but it was a more active approach as we not only learn about the tools that we could implement uh, both in intercultural communication and entrepreneurship but also by working on the a uh, real solution to the real challenge, we could actually implement them and, you know, do our own research and uh, see what resources are available that we can utilize. Also, uh, at the end of the project, uh, I could take part in the virtual conference uh, where I could see what were the other team's ideas uh, about the solutions for global other global challenges. And what I could see, and I think like that is something that will, uh, is very important for me now and very practical, is that now uh, in the middle of the global pandemic, most of the ideas uh, utilize digital tools, digital resources. And I think now after the project, few months after the project, while I'm starting my another year at the university and most of my classes are online, it's really important uh, that after the project, I know the tools and I know how to use them. So I can lead the discussion and maybe uh, engage other students uh, to contribute more uh, because I know that it's, uh, as it was hard for me in the beginning of the NICE project, it is now hard for them to somehow find uh, themselves in the new situation we are now all in. So yeah, that was like a really great experience to somehow, you know, find out more about this virtual setting before the pandemic started. So that's uh, from me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, indeed, that's something we noticed this year, and I think we probably all did across the project, is that the students who were on our virtual exchange programs were the better prepared uh, when everyone else had to move online. Um, at least our virtual exchange projects could continue and help you build those skills. Thank you so much, both of you, for, for joining today. I'm going to pass um, the mic back. I'm going to wrap up, I believe, and move on to questions. Yeah, um, I would uh, invite all of the panelists, actually, to turn your video on. It would be nice to see a full screen with all the wonderful people who have contributed to this discussion today. Um, we realize that it, this is the time that was scheduled for the end of the webinar, but we would very much, um, you know, we, we would all be more than happy to stay on for a few additional minutes um, to answer any questions that you might have directly for the panelists that were not already answered um, by our colleagues in the chat. So if you have any questions for our panelists, you can share them in the Q&A function. In the meantime, my colleague uh, Francesca Helm is going to post a link to um, an evaluation survey that we would like you to take just a few minutes to complete. Um, that helps us uh, better understand how to improve um, these types of activities in the future. So Francesca has just put a link to the survey in the text chat, um, you can click, click on it or you can um, just um, copy it and paste it into a browser.
So I don't see any questions in the Q&A. Ah, so um, one person is asking, will links to the research discussed also be provided? And people are nodding their heads. <laughs> so yes, and um, will the PowerPoint presentation be shared? The recording will be shared that has okay. the PowerPoint slides. Okay, okay, fantastic. We will also uh, share the slides. Okay, and there was another question. Um, as both teachers and students, how effectively would you say that participating in VE prepared you for a life on screen during the pandemic? Would anybody like to answer? Maybe one of our students. Okay, or, or not, a teacher. <laughs> Kasha? Yeah, I can answer. I mean, I was absolutely happy that I uh, got the skills first uh, thanks to uni collaboration and uh, evolve uh, uh, vir virtual exchange course design because this was my first maybe interaction um, in an online environment. It started in 2019, so just a year before the pandemic and I did my first project then. So uh, when the that project in 2020 started and students hesitated. There was a very difficult moment when, when the rector of my university said, all classes in all forms are suspended. <laughs> students understood that maybe we have no classes. I had to continue, convince my students, let's go on. Those virtual projects can be done. And a rector does not mean that we cannot work virtually. So the transition was very easy for me. And I'm sure maybe, maybe Natalia will confirm that for the students as well, because they had the tools at their disposal and they could imagine that it is possible to work online, not only internationally, but also nationally within our institution. Natalia, what can you say? Did you feel frustrated or did you feel ready to move to trans transition to online learning? Turn on your mic. Turn, turn on your microphone, Natalia. Sorry. <laughs> I think that students are ready for changes and um, it's okay that our classes and our virtual exchange was really virtual and uh, it's good experience for us like students, we can um, use our digital skills in it. Thank you. And there's also another question specifically to the students who are still here with us. So did you gain any contacts abroad that you will stay in contact with? So in other words, did you make long, longer lasting friends through a virtual exchange? If I can answer, I, as I previously mentioned, I made a lot of friends abroad and uh, especially from the Middle East that it was uh, really, really different from my expectations. And uh, I also done um, a sort of report about virtual exchange experience for my university as uh, for, uh, for my exam of political science. And uh, in this report, uh, I put uh, uh, like an interview and uh, some question made uh, directly to people from the Middle East and uh, from, uh, from the virtual exchange experience. So it was uh, really, really challenging and, uh, and uh, really great, it's a really great experiences also for, uh, for my personal uh, relationship and um, yeah, for the group, uh, for the group and the intercultural, uh, intercultural um, connection. I can also just confirm that I know of cases where um, small groups, this is pre-COVID, actually decide to physically meet up in one country. So, and they, you know, maintain groups on Facebook and those sorts of things. So I think, yes, everything Duletta said, and yes, it's confirmed by many other groups as well. Um, so this is a question more to the teachers on a practical side um, and more, oops. Oh, she already answered it. Okay. Um, <laughs> So this is a question, uh, Cecilia, was the exchange voluntary or a part of a speci specific activity in a seminar? No, it was a uh, voluntary and, and I, I, I decided to join, like it was originally an idea from Malin who I had the chance to meet before. Uh, and then uh, I, I, I thought it was ideal for one of the classes that I was teaching at, 
at, at the, during our first semester here. I teach multimodal in these courses, but I also teach, uh, Nico is part of the, you know, the, the Spanish teacher, you know, program. So um, I kind of combined two courses. It was some, yeah, very like, you know, uh, I, it, it was an idea that came from my side. <laughs> Thank you. And there is a question. Oh, my colleagues are answering them in a written form. So thank you for doing that. Um, so one question is, is there any facilitator course this term? Um, correct me. If, yeah, exactly. There isn't. Um, yeah, there, there is, but it's both. Well, exactly. Yeah. Um, and so the Erasmus Plus Virtual Exchange project is actually ending at the end of December. Um, so the the organization that offers the facilitation training will continue to do so. Um, it's just that it will most likely, most likely be for a fee. Um, it's one more round of training. So for educators who want to do transnational EVE projects for people, ideally with a partner. So Miriam, what that's for free. <laughs> could you put a link to that in the, um, I will just a second. I'm going okay. to, wait. I will do. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so the question, how much do Salia courses cost, uh, is that there's no simple answer to that question. And I would just suggest you get in touch directly with the people at Salia. Uh, and I think... Can I say something about the facilitators? I mean, through Erasmus Virtual Exchange, a lot of facilitators have been trained and some are here listening to us, like with Rianne. And facilitators, um, I think they're, they're going to be really good to continuing the kind of virtual exchange activity too. And so, you know, again, contacting organizations, also unique collaboration, we've been working with facilitators who will facilitate sessions, you know, for pre-mobility students, if you have specific groups. I think the idea, the concept of a facilitator is, is, is a very interesting um, and useful for higher education to support the quality of interactions that take place. And I think um, that will certainly have to continue to be um, developed and used in future projects. So Uni Collaboration has a pool of facilitators also for the year, but I think it, it's important to, to keep that in mind also in designing um, projects. Um, so there's a question from Angelo, who says he's the coordinator of the Faculty of Modern Languages in Cardiff. Um, and he's interested in virtual exchange and wants to know if there is a possibility to have the email address of one of the lecturers so that he can contact you after the meeting to have some talks about VE. Um, so before I pass it over to see, um, just um, UD Collaboration actually has what are called office hours every Wednesday morning. Um, and you can join those office hours um, and just chat with the people who are online at that time. Maybe Fran, you could provide a link, a Zoom link for that. Um, any of the other lecturers have uh, comments about having chats with people interested in virtual exchange, how that can happen. Okay, then I'll just say another good way is to do the training. <laughs> and I think, I think uh, lots of the people here involved, lots of the lecturers would agree that it was through the training that they met a lot of people and feel like they've, through the training, you really do create a sense of community, even the teachers, so before they even design their own virtual exchange, the teachers cre start creating their own community online, I think. Would you agree with that? I would absolutely agree with that. I, I did, as I said, I participated in the training offered by Evolve and Unique Collaborations, so two different ones. And the, yeah, they were so different, but complementary. Uh, and I would really insist that everybody takes part, any educator takes part in such a virtual training, if there is such a chance, because you are put in the shoes of the student and you see how it works. And uh, uh, courses offered, let's say in Poland, where there are only Polish teachers participating and talking about international and intercultural learning outcomes, it's not the same, because there are no perspectives given by the teachers from all around the world. This was the, the beauty of the course. No, no, the mentors were important, but the participants were even more important because they contributed to, to my learning and I hope I also helped them somehow as well. I second that. <laughs> okay, so then there's a question from Perry. Um, it's actually a series of questions, so pay, pay attention. 
Um, when working with other universities globally, how did you, A, identify the partners and connect with those universities, B, build or develop and align the project within the curriculum? Um, after all different universities are on academic calendars, and then there are different time zones, would you like to comment on, is it best to have these VE embedded as something compulsory into an existing curriculum or as an option as a standalone project, for example, foc focusing on the sustainable development goals? So he's asking about, he or she, excuse me, I'm not sure if it's a he or she, um, is asking about finding partners, then actually how do you de build and develop and align the different calendars, et cetera, and whether you think it's better to have it embedded in an existing course or have it as a standalone project. I think this is the moment where we could um, uh, indicate that there's the partner finding tool on the Unicode Collaboration website and that there are fa um, partner fairing um, events organized um, together by Unicode Collaboration at EVE. I hope I'm not forgetting somebody. So that's um, I Thank think a good Rianne. opportunity. Rianne posted the link. Sorry. And um, it's a good opportunity to find partners. And then, of course, you, once you have a partner, then you need also to discuss very much in detail how you will planify and schedule the the uh, virtual exchange, what the different steps are, which objectives every each each of the partners has, and things like that. So this is really in. I would say you, you need to have the the major ideas in the beginning, and then the, the rest is really through discussing with, with sorry discussing with your partner. But there's also well the training opportunities, of course, where you can get all those answers then. Yes, if I may, um, perhaps comment just on point C. Um, uh, we've seen we've seen different versions of VE, the embedded um, compulsory into a course or a standalone project. We have taken the route with NICE of it being transdisciplinary to bring students from different parts of the universities, like Jackson was saying, any level as well. We had first year undergraduate, we had masters, we had PhD students of every discipline. Also because we led the project and we are an international office um, and we did not have necessarily academics driving that. Um, I believe projects where academics are driving rather than an international office tend to be more embedded in a course and that's something that an, a lecturer perhaps wants to add to their existing course. So for, for, for us, number C would depend who is really carrying the project, whether it will be transversal or embedded in a specific department of the university, at least for us. I think one of the things we, we love about virtual exchange is that it's very flexible, but that also means that there are no really easy prescriptive answers to a lot of questions. <laughs> and so, um, you know, given that flexibility, there are many different options. And I do know, though, that the, in the advanced training that um, Miriam is running within the um, context of Erasmus Plus virtual exchange, um, they do allow teachers who don't have partners to participate um, and I think there are several cases in which partners actually met one another in the training. Um, so I would like to know, this is from Brian, I would like to know which activities the students found to be most constructive, engaging, profitable, satisfying in terms of building their intercultural awareness. A concrete example would be helpful. And I think that's directed to, on my screen, the three at the bottom, Violeta, Nico, and Natalia. So what activities did you engage in that you think helped develop your intercultural awareness the most? I can speak briefly in my to that. Case. Um, I, oh, so sorry. Um, I'll just say very briefly. Um, I think that having a deadline and like a project that we were working towards um, really, it, it kind of forced those opportunities to happen. You know, the, the fact that we had to, at the end of the project, have our actionable item or at the end of the summer school pitch our ideas. I mean, it kind of, you know, it had to happen that we had to work on a team. We had to develop an idea. Um, so I'll just add that, that like kind of having an end goal that you're working towards, I think kind of pushes students to, to kind of build those connections. 
Yoletta, did you want to say something? My kids, I think, uh, uh, online discussion, dialogue, because, for example, when we, we attended the course and we focused on migration, we had different perspective because I was, um, a, I'm Italian and uh, people from Syria had their, uh, their different visions. So uh, this discussion made us uh, um, to, uh, more tolerant and also um, this was this, uh, this discussion and this changing. Uh, Nico or Natalia, would you like to add anything? If I can uh, say something about the oh, night. Oh, sorry, I didn't see you there. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, so, uh, in, in, in case of uh, our project in the NICE program, as we were working, my group was working on the uh, challenge uh, related to food waste, uh, we had a lot of discussions on how to solve it and how does the problem look in the respective countries where we live because we're all from different countries and studying in different universities so the problem of food waste uh, looks uh, really you know differently in, in different countries and I think like uh, as we were uh, somehow encouraged to, to uh, exchange the thoughts uh, we, we had the opportunity to discuss also many other things uh, along the way and also as we were working toward uh, the final goal, as Jackson said, there was a lot of opportunity to also see how uh, people from different countries and cultures uh, work uh, because uh, our habits uh, were very different. And uh, I think like it was a great opportunity to confront, uh, you know, because there is no one way uh, to work with other people and it was good to, you know, uh, see how other people are working as well. So, yeah. Yeah, I would just summarize the students' replies in two words and it's collaboration and interaction, right? It, it, it's collaborating with other students and interacting with other students that makes it an enriching experience. And that's what differentiates it, I think, from other forms of online learning. So however you develop that as teachers, however you develop that in your task design, it's the collaboration and the interaction, I think, are the key words. Um, it reminds me jumping in and adding one thing, because I instead I didn't take it as a credit for my school, but I was still um, considered to be a, a student participant. And I think it's sensitive to be mentioning that one other thing that happened in one of our groups was that we had a participant who identified as queer and uh, he was uh, based in a country where uh, actually that that's uh, gender identity was criminalized. And his assumption was that if he immigrates to, to Europe or to Italy, then he will have all of his rights and nothing will be discriminated against him. And um, all of us from, from whichever country we were in, we were genuinely concerned so speaking about the sort of stereotypes that exist and that you think in a certain country, just because it's based in the European Union, you have X, Y, Z privileges or my own immigration journey, which seemed to be like, I'm having the time of my life as a non-European student in, in Europe, which is absolutely not true. It's had its privileges, but also its challenges. That was also a good, a good moment of realization that um, unless we talk about sensitive topics in an area topics that deal with with human with humanity with our lives um we're just prone to stay with stereotypes and and with misconceptions i thought it's good to be mentioning this here in the context because the rest of the courses that i've been hearing about like food waste like a project like a summer school they seem to be very scientifically driven which is really good because when you put this a virtual exchange in an academic context you can definitely see the benefits but it's also important to to think that it actually has a use it can help um, young people make better decisions in their life or to make more informed decisions, if, if not to use the word better or worse, but to make more informed decisions with more awareness. I hope that also was a good concrete example to help our questions. And sorry for like abruptly jumping in for this. No, I really appreciate it. And I think it's a wonderful example. And it also highlights, I think, the way in which virtual exchange forces students also to reflect on their own culture and what's going on where they live. And so it's not just about learning about the other, it's also, you know, 
by being by hearing a student assuming that if you're homosexual in Italy everything is perfect makes you actually living in Italy reflect on well what is the situation for for gay people in Italy so um, that's an important another important aspect of virtual exchange um, we have no more questions and you know we've gone a good 25 minutes over um, so um, if I don't know, do our panelists or students have anything else that we'd like to add before we end the session? Okay, well, I would like to thank all of you for a very interesting and stimulating discussion about how three different projects um, were able to show the value of virtual exchange um, for the students and the teachers. Um, and we especially appreciate having the students here. Thank you so much for taking the time, but also the courage <laughs> to come on. Speaking in webinars is, is different from the kind of virtual exchange you did where you can see all the people you're talking to, right? So this is a very different context. So thank you for taking the time. Um, hearing what you experienced is, is really important, I think, for all of us. Um, if there are no additional Okay, last thing, Gabriela wants to know if Saki Yager can put the link to his resource into the chat. <laughs> and of course, you can get in touch um, with any of us um, if you would like to. So um, you'll be receiving um, the recording and the slides, and there you'll find information about how to get in touch with any of the panelists. And um, we also really would like to remind you, if possible, to complete the evaluation survey. Um, it really helps inform our decisions going forward in terms of the quality of our webinars. So thank you to everyone who um, contributed and to all of the wonderful people in the chat who were having a very lively discussion for much of the time. So thank you again, and um, we will see you at the next webinar. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, students, above all. And Marlin, I love your project. Yeah, it's great. Thanks for sharing this session very effectively. <laughs> Sarah, I think you have to stop recording. <laughs> Can we stop? Do you stop have to recording? Stop recording.